I guess to begin this whole thing, um, unlike every other presentation I've given over the last couple of decades, I actually really want to say thank you to one person. Um, obviously, Agent X, because he's the, he was the genesis of this whole talk uh, last year at, at DEF CON 15. So that made it really, really nice for me. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is at the beginning of this, of this year, uh, I was completely unable to give any talks whatsoever. Uh, I had contracted a pretty insane illness that left me fairly paralyzed and everything else. And so in this instance, uh, for the first time ever probably for me, I'm actually thanking someone outside this community uh, just uh, for the medical care that I received that pretty much got me back to normal. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Lee. <laughs> on this one. What we're going to talk about today is open source warfare, and it's a topic that I think all of us know about, and it's something I really, really enjoy talking about quite a bit. So I, to begin with here, I really like the graphic with the teddy bear, the balloons, and the bomb, uh, because that kind of gives us a little pictorial representation of what open source warfare is all about. Um, just a crazy thing, it's, it's really nice, it's innocuous, and yet it's dangerous at the same time. So what is open source warfare and who uses it? Essentially, what we're going to look at today are how armies behave in the battlefield, but more importantly, from the open source warfare perspective, what do insurgents use? You know, what are we, for example, in the United States facing in Iraq? What are the Indians uh, facing? throughout their country, uh, what are the Sri Lankans facing with the Tamil Tigers? It, it just goes on and on and on. There isn't a country on earth that doesn't experience some form of this. Uh, what I really like about doing this one at DEF CON is it really kind of speaks to you guys too because computer skills, computer uh, knowledge in a way, um, not just in the security arena, um, but also in the communications arena as a whole, really impacts all of us and it's used every single day. Some some of the stuff that you develop amazingly winds up on a battlefield. And I don't know if anyone's been to a battlefield uh, anytime recently, but it has changed a little bit. But you know, battlefields are battlefields. It doesn't really matter, um, you know, for, for better or for worse for me. I've, I've been to a number of zones in my lifetime. And it, it doesn't make a doggone bit of difference. It's still as gruesome and as gory and as terrible. It's still as ethically and morally compromised as you can imagine. And every side still has the same issues. Um, you know, at least some armies around the world actually recognize the ethical implications of what you do, and some armies don't. Some insurgents do, some don't. But all of them, regardless of the side that they fight on, actually believes that they're ethically correct, that they're morally correct. And it's a very interesting one, and it comes down to some of those questions. Does the end justify the means, et cetera, et cetera? Thankfully for us, we're not going to explore ethics or morality today. So <laughs> that's a good one. And because we're in Las Vegas especially, we're not going to really explore this topic at all. So, There are a couple of things I want to say at the beginning of this. And, you know, last night when I was kind of going through this presentation with a friend of mine, not only did he suggest I pull a couple of slides, but um, he also suggested maybe I want to kind of tidy this presentation up a little bit and not show any graphic pictures of what happens in warfare and, and what the actual results are. The, for anyone who's curious, they're freely available just about anywhere on the internet. But uh, it's too early in the morning, and I don't think we need to be compromised with that type of stuff. I do want you to know, however, that there are a lot of things that when you do, um, you, you, they can go wrong pretty badly. You can wind up in jail. Um, and that's really not the worst thing that can happen to you. I, uh, there are a million things, but be very, very careful. However, that having been said, the exploits that you come up with, the exploits that we come up with uh, across the board are tremendously important. And the fact that they're somewhat open source, and by what I mean by open source in this instance, is open source in the context that everybody um, shares information with everybody else and it's rarely segregated to a degree um, or a firewall to a degree that it can't be looked at by just about any person. So if you post something in, 
you know, to a server in New York, it just as well might be seen by a militant in Bangladesh. So it's, it's interesting and it's very important because the armies around the world, not just in the United States, actually spend a tremendous amount of time taking a look at this stuff and sometimes developing counter strategies or at least, as we'll see in one instance, at least to be prepared for what um, is coming up. That having been said again, we're going to keep the examples a little bit generic and I just want to stress this one, this one thing again. This is really a value neutral presentation, okay? We're not going to talk about who's right and who's wrong, all right? It has nothing to do with it. I don't care what side of a debate you're on. We're only looking at the pure science, the pure technology here. We're not going to look at any ethical dimension. I guess the biggest misconception about open source warfare is that it's a little bit, and in some ways, in a funny way, it's a little bit like MacGyver, you know, where you get a toothpick and you've got 30 seconds and a tube of toothpaste and some floss and all of a sudden you can save a bomb from exploding or blow one up yourself based on you do this, this, and this. In a way, it is, um, and in a very fundamental way, it isn't. Um, and I also want, you know, all of you guys and girls this morning to remember Open source warfare has come, it has as long a tradition as warfare itself. Some of the earliest examples, just so you know, historically, go back thousands and thousands of years um, to battles. Even concepts like, you know, Stego um, go all the way back, um, you know, thousands of years, which are, you know, a form of hidden communications as well. Um, but on the modern battlefield, what we see now is a very heavy degree an extremely uh, almost over-reliance on technology, whether it's the United States or the Israelis of conventional armies that have recently been engaged. We're actually seeing somewhat of a, a parody what's taking place right now in Ossetia with Georgia and Russia. But, you know, the counterinsurgents, however, have changed the, the, the tactics just a little bit. And they use things like microwave ovens, um, mobile phones. We see examples of that every day. Um, remote controlled aircraft, toy robots, digital cameras, sniffer tools, you name it. I was a little bummed out that I missed the war ballooning demo, but I know when I went over there it had been canceled. Um, we're going to look at one uh, war rocketry example, too, in a little bit. So. To get us started on this whole topic, I'm going to show one other slide here to begin with, and we'll end the presentation after the night, no, just teasing. But um, we'll, it's going to tell you everything you need to know about open source warfare. It's funny in a way, um, and, and it's kind of tragic comic in another, and, and yet it's, it's deadly serious in the most fundamental way. What we're looking at on the left-hand side is the Big Dog uh, project done by DARPA. And the uh, center picture, as you can see, was done by a company called Boston Dynamics, and they work with DARPA on this whole thing to provide a type of pack mule automated automation system. Essentially, it's a very sophisticated robot that works on four legs, you know, walks around. As you can see, it carries packs, et cetera, et cetera. And what that is, is an adaptation of probably one of the oldest forms of military transportation known to man, which is a camel. You know, elephants also uh, qualify in this instance, but this is a camel. You know, a couple of things come to mind immediately. And the first one, since many of you are taxpayers, that I'll remind you is, I'm guessing the one on the top left is fundamentally far more expensive, um, a lot more expensive. Uh, and by the time it's actually ready to use in the field, it will have been astronomically expensive to develop. Um, there are benefits, there are shortcomings. I know when you look at the specs of the whole thing, it looks really pretty cool. Um, it'll be able to walk so many miles, it can do, carry so many pounds, et cetera, et cetera at a very, very high cost. Um, also for troops potentially operating in the field, what you're looking at is breakdowns, mechanical maintenance, um, detectability, which is extremely important. So th these are also going to be issues. But then again, when you look at a place like Afghanistan that has a lot of uh, very challenging terrain, you can see the track vehicles aren't going to work here. So something like this is actually not too bad. Now, another adaptation of that, of course, is the camel. Um, you know, whether it's horses, camels, elephants, you name it, mules, you know, just go down the line. 
It's very cheap. Detectability, yeah, of course. But, you know, they're generic generally to the region in which they're used. So in this, in this country, we'll use horses, you know, or mules. And in other countries, they'll use elephants or they use camels. So they actually fit into the, the uh, terrain, so detectability is something kind of low. The other thing that's a little interesting here for us to consider in OSW is the fact that when you see a robot, for example, the top two pictures, you know automatically it's a war machine. So right away, there's a predefined notion that once it's detected, you know automatically what it is. It must be destroyed, it must be hindered, it must be hurt, end of story. Whereas the other one, there's a low degree of, of ability to detect. Is it, to look at the packs on the, on the sides of both of them. Are they, which one is most likely to be carrying a weapon, for example? Which one is most likely to be carrying explosives? It goes back to the suicide bomber concept. Um, same issue here. So we all face that. And now, of course, we have a very gratuitous photo coming up, uh, which is going to be nice. And I just thought I'd throw that in because we're here today. But I also want to talk, uh, because there's really no fundamental reason for this one to be here, I guess, other than, than to show animals can carry something else other than weapons. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to talk for just a very brief moment about a very important concept, and it's one that I've been exploring recently, and it's this whole concept of the narrative of myth, you know, narratives of a nation and elements of myth and, and things like that. Um, warfare in many respects, and open source warfare in particular, really does appeal to certain paradigms. Um, when you think of the narrative of the wars the United States is currently involved in, there are particular subtexts, there are particular narratives that are extremely important. I know one of the groups that I belong to is called the National Military Intelligence Association, and they just published a, really a very lengthy article, and it's very uh, unusual um, in terms of what they actually do, that only discussed elements in the narrative of warfare, how warfare is presented, you know, the, all these concepts of sacrifice and transcendence death and transformation is very, very interesting, actually, when you think of it in those terms. And it's also very interesting when you look at it in terms of what motivates people to do things, whether it's fight a war as a conventional army or actually to run into the uh, counterinsurgency or COIN, as the acronym is known. We're going to take a quick look at Lebanon. Um, there's been a lot going on there in the past couple of years, and I think many of you are really important, uh, uh, importantly involved in some respects in, in this one. Um, I'm showing you a slide from actually one of the more uh, influential members of the Lebanese coalitions, um, although he's not a government member. Um, and this is a gentleman named Nasrallah. And I love this slide because it actually talks about something that's fundamentally important uh, across the board in the emerging battlefield. And if you look at the two things that he's saying, it's really, really important. Um, many of our members died as martyrs because of landline and mobile communications. Fair enough. And our communication network is the most important weapon in any resistance. This, I think these two statements actually sum up the narrative across the board from country to country. I mean, whether it's Sri Lanka or Colombia, these two actually very succinctly sum up what's the issue. Um, it's just absolutely incredible. So let's take a slightly deeper look here at Lebanon so we get a better sense. Um, a couple of months ago, there was yet another flare-up um, in Lebanon. There was fighting in the streets. Actually, the fighting had spread outside to the countryside. And it really resulted in the fact that the government itself attempted to quash third-party communications networks, um, telecommunications networks. The other thing that complicated this fight is there are actually some, from the Lebanese perspective, some very, very major players in, in their political and cultural lives. Syria, which to some extent could be argued really is uh, that Lebanon is just an extension of Syria, at least the Syrians believe so. Uh, Iran, of course, who we're all uh, pretty aware of uh, Iranian involvement um, in Lebanese uh, politics um, and actually war fighting capability. And Israel, of course, who's, who's declared war a couple of times. And uh, there are extremely interesting lessons here. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So. What happened in this instance is that the third parties, meaning Nasala's groups, 
um, went ahead and established communications networks. What they did is they, piggy to start with at least, they piggybacked on top of the copper networks within uh, Lebanon itself. Um, they extended the copper networks. They created new optical networks, um, which is very, very interesting uh, itself. And they piggybacked, and I probably should have said it in there, they created completely new mobile uh, cell towers and mobile networks uh, for communications. They did this for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons they did this is because copper networks are eminently traceable, and they also require warfighters to go, or I should say uh, counterinsurgents to go, to a particular point in order to make a phone call. So they were easily detectable and hence killed. Uh, other things here in which they've done enormously interesting work that's really of DEF CON caliber, and they, they never get abused, I think, to come here and talk about it. But uh, as far as VOIP goes, uh, some enormously interesting things. Um, they've really taken some of the open source protocols of encrypted communications one direction to another on VOIP and taken that to the next level and created an incredibly secure communications network. So it really became an unsolvable issue for the government, and it led to war, as you can imagine. Now, we're going to take a look at two little old maps here. Um, one is kind of a, on the top right, it's just kind of a topological map to give you general orientation. You can see Syria, Israel's down, you know, lower left, um, Mediterranean on the top. So very interesting little one. Now, if you look at the red lines, though, in the lower left, um, what you're seeing are those copper networks that we see, and those were set up originally by the government. Now, I want you to basically imagine fingers and nodes emanating, two colors of fingers and nodes, it's up to your imagination, emanating from those lines and parroting those lines, and that'll give you some sense of parallel networks that have been created. But overlay onto that a third one of circles and dots of mobile networks that were created. So what happened is it really became impossible for them, to, A, to dismantle any third party from the government network, big problem, because it had been so co-opted. And you know, in the other instance, it really became impossible to, to shut down that network um, because so many variants of it came to exist. I'm going to skip undersea cable disruptions as much as I'd like to talk about that one here. Now I'm going to take a look at some just basic, you know, however you feel about Web 2.0, but I, I want you to get a sense of a little bit of triangulation and, and how things are found in the Web 2.0 world in areas that we use. Um, you know, on the right-hand side, we're, ta we're taking a look at something from Sense Networks, and it's a really nice little application that actually helps you find the hotspots downtown in San Francisco. Um, you can see pretty much based on protocol where people are and what they're doing, what they're congregating around. And Sense came up with this idea, great people by the way, but they came up with this idea that if people are congregating around certain clubs and restaurants, those are the hot spots. So fine. And looped on the, on the left-hand side has met with a slightly less uh, energetic response, but they have a fairly similar one that's for a couple of phones, the iPhone included, that works on this, on this same concept. Now, in a military context, we look at this and see, we begin to see the emergence of targeting maps um, that are actually fundamentally very important. Now, we're not talking about targeting infrastructure. We're actually targeting either groups of people or a particular person. This has very important ramifications for law enforcement, very important ramifications, obviously, for militaries. So you begin to overlay these maps with different colors, and they get more and more and more specific. And it becomes very, very interesting. When you think, and I, you know, I had a really interesting talk with the Cisco guys a couple of months back. When you start thinking about the number of protocols now in terms of what we carry around every day and what we utilize every day just in my own pockets and computer, I'm already, you know, a number of protocols deep in wireless communication. Um, things start getting very, very, very specific. Tremendous opportunity if you're a military person here. Now this is a little company uh, that is emerging um, and they're building on concepts that already exist. Um, and that's why I'm using them actually, Sage, Sage Tech. Um, 
they're working on something that's already in the field. I mean, obviously, on the U.S. side, we know of, th of things like the Predator drones, um, among others. Um, Israeli military makes use of also proprietary drones, et cetera, et cetera. This is actually, when you put these two uh, slides together, really room and food for thought. It's just something to think about. Now, you can take a step back and say, well, you know, great, we're going after an enemy. But it also from a law enforcement perspective, um, when you begin, instead of shooting bullets, we're actually tracking, instead of uh, shooting rockets, we're actually able to uh, surveil an individual based on a specificity of protocol becomes extremely, extremely interesting. Of course, the battlefields we're fighting on in the Middle East, uh, for example, right now, we're not worried too much about protocols because they don't exist to the same degree that they would in downtown San Francisco. But I do want to make you aware of the fact that things like uh, UAV sniper uh, aircraft have a very, very interesting little application. I'm going to just go through a couple more slides and we'll go through it. But I want you also at the end of this talk to realize that everything pretty much on the, on the modern battlefield is all driven specifically by mathematics. Um, there, I can't think of anything that's done on the modern battlefield from a traditional army's perspective that isn't driven by mathematics. And I strongly urge you, if you don't know anything about thermodynamics, believe it or not, the second law of thermodynamics and non-equilibrium uh, uh, thermodynamics just has an enormous thought impact on what we're on these problems that we're all working on right now. So I'm going to show you really quickly something I ran into randomly, which is a surveillance helicopter. It wasn't intended as such. It was shown at Infocom just to do nice little uh, you know, aerial shots in HD. But it's actually pretty interesting. I we take a look at this one and start thinking of those. Actually, let's go back. And I just want you to see a couple of the capabilities. Um, it's a non-US company that makes this one. Uh, the price is about 400 bucks off the shelf, including an HD camera. It has a one mile radius, 20 minute battery life, and encrypted comlink, which I find extremely interesting. Um, but I want you to now think about something like this in the hands of a counterinsurgent, flying it at dusk in the mountains in Afghanistan. 400 bucks, and that's a US price, so therefore inflated. Buy it in Taiwan, buy that in Burma, yeah, a little cheaper. Um, but all of a sudden, you start to see the logistical problems for surveillance of established armies. What begins to happen when there's cheap technology out there that people can use very easily, very, very easily? And it, it becomes a little scary. And let's see, we'll go ahead and pop through. I guess this will be the last two or three things I'll talk about in this presentation. But um, one of the emerging things that's kind of interesting is the use of microwaves in the battlefield. And we're not talking about huge microwave towers or generators or anything else. Um, but we're actually talking about people who are starting to think about, and I haven't seen deployed yet in any battlefield, but the use of a conventional microwave oven that's been disassembled, you know, you put a little hood on it, direct the beam, and you can begin to defeat some of the IED sensors that exist on current military vehicles. Now, I want to really be clear, it's not in use right now. The military is aware of it, so I wouldn't get you know, too worked up. But it actually shows the level of innovation. And I included a link in here that you guys can go click on. There's a whole bunch of stuff there um, that will give you a good idea of what's capable with this technology. And again, you know, just people like all of us, really, who like to tinker, like to figure stuff out, put things together in a new way and use them against something else. Um, it, it's enormous. And, you know, every morning when I make my uh, tea, and I use the microwave to heat the water, I actually think of, of this technology because it's a really good reminder of, oh my God, what else in this kitchen can, can kill? You know, it's, it's really pretty amazing. The little picture you see there is just a really cheap solution to defeat LED surveillance cameras. Um, extremely cheap. It's been carried on a lot of, a lot of uh, websites, how you can do that. There's some countermeasures. I actually know a couple of guys now that have 
uh, variants on this technology in order to uh, defeat this technology, but it's a little expensive and it's not very widely deployed. So, you know, railroad yards, for example, use LED technology for sur surveillance cameras. So if you're up to no good, thankfully they're transitioning, but if you're up to no good, you know, chances are using uh, this type of stuff, again, easily searchable, easily findable um, for things to think about. And then yesterday, I also want to give just a little shout out to the CV org people who actually opened my eyes uh, to a particular hardware trojan that they were able to uh, implement on Linksys routers. And it was actually so innovative, so simple, and so unique that I, I got really, really stoked. And, you know, as just a little side note, um, through their technology, what they were able to do was surreptitiously uh, get a Linksys router to uh, broadcast Morse code. And I, I think that's really kind of interesting when you start thinking about very, very discreet uh, communication systems. It becomes very, very scary when you start thinking about hidden embedded communication systems that can be implemented um, from afar and surveilled from a safe distance and communications being transported that way. So it becomes extremely, extremely interesting. This is just yet another example of really good information on how to do a high energy radio frequency um, directed weapon. Um, once again, you're interested in this stuff, Topside has your information. So you know, keep in mind, I'm actually being told I have time, so I guess there's a Q&A afterwards directly across the hall, but in 104. But thank you guys very much, and I'm really, really grateful uh, to you all. All right, and thank you. So, thank you.